Good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad that you've committed yourself to coming to the Hair Story listening table. We launched Hair Story to hear from black youth in care about their hair care struggles that they had in the systems of care. But in talking about the issues, we discovered through dialogue that other issues were at hand. So we went from tackling hair to moving beyond hair. And we started to address the inequalities and the cultural struggles that our youth were facing. These were their unspoken journeys. But today in this room are youth whose experiences have been silenced for far too long. And we've given them that opportunity to have a right to speak. Growing up in CAS, I jumped from foster home to foster home, right? And from that, it's like my culture was stripped from me. I was forced to like go to church, um, like a Catholic church. I was being Catholic, just like be involved with their norms, what was in my norms, right? And that really broke down my relationship with my adoptive mother. Being taken away from my family, that definitely changed, like, I feel as if I lost a part of my childhood because my focus was no longer playing outside and having fun with my, fun, fun with my friends, but more so I need to take care of my younger brothers and making sure that they stick together. I don't know who this lady is and she doesn't understand our culture. And so I need to make sure that she does not brain. I remember, I remember clearly thinking at 11 years old, I was like, she's trying to brainwash my little brothers to be little white boys. I was so adamant about it. And then someone's like, Mercy, that's racist. In my head, I was like, no, like this lady's clearly trying to brainwash my younger siblings. Being in care, I learned in that foster family how to stay quiet. I learned how to not speak up because if I speak up, then she will challenge me and she will lecture me and she will drill her opinions and views in towards me and I just wanted to avoid all of that. I transitioned from like childcare to like mental care. I was just adopted from a young age and growing up it was kind of hard not knowing like actual blood and there was just like a lot of problems that I dealt with. I dealt with like depression at an early age, maybe Remember, like, when it was first noticed, I was in grade four. And, like, it was just kind of, like, separation issues from people that I really love. I got caught up in the youth justice system, you know, trying to make some money for myself, making bad decisions off course, and then obviously getting sent to prison for a little bit and doing a little bit of time. Not a long time, but enough to make me realize that I have potential to be something better than, than a kid that's just in and out of the system. I was in the same foster home for 11 years with a... Uh, a white family. They were nice enough, but they didn't understand me as a person. Like, they don't know, they didn't understand my needs as a black youth. I don't get really treated equal in my foster family. I feel like my foster brother's treated better than me. And then I feel that, that that makes me feel bad about myself. And I don't get, I don't get the things I need. Like, my skin's always dry because they don't have cream for me. As a black girl growing up, in these different systems, I've experienced a lot of racism. I've experienced a lot of discrimination. I've experienced what it feels like to be the only black girl in an environment where my visible appearance is not the norm. Growing up, I thought I was the only one. And as I branched out into the world, I realized actually a lot of other males and females uh, like myself we, we all experience the same, the same thing. Within Children's Aid Society, in terms of support, I didn't really get much, much support that I've, I actually could have had. I didn't really have much contact with my workers, so I never really knew what my rights were and never really knew what I was entitled to until I got out of it. They will always see me as, as a beautiful boy. Like, I want to be few as a person with strength and weaknesses. Young People speaks about issues of not having appropriate services. They're talking about culturally anchored mental health support. Young People all talked about the systemic racism that they experience within the system. They feel that they're treated differently from other young people given the same kind of issues. We spend a lot of time talking about the system as a whole, but I think the issues that young people face in the system is the fact that they often feel lost and invisible in it. 
And then when kids don't have connections, it isn't about the system anymore. It becomes about the fact that they just feel lost. When you have passion and you have dreams as a child, you think everything's doable. And then when you start getting pushed down and pushed down, the fact is, is all that passion turns into something else. It turns into anger. And the fact is, you just haven't channeled it the right way. Look at how the system treats black youth right now. It's sad, right? There's youth struggling. And at the end of the day, the system can, the system can act like they care, but they don't. They just put up a front. It's very difficult to speak truth to power. It is. It's been forever. I mean, this it's history of oppressed peoples. Just as we talked with First Nations, you can't pretend there's not a legacy of racism that it's not like a, a black youth just got discovered as being black and, and was born and now they're in something new. They're in a, a chain of events. Youth of other races like to ask, why don't you wash your hair every single day? Or why don't you do this? Or why don't you do that? Like our hair is completely different in comparison to yours, in comparison to yours. It's, it's built differently. We're all built differently. And, and to think that you're judging me because of my habits, my bodily habits, is not fair. The importance of hair in our culture stems back to, I was actually, I actually read a book called, it was called Hair Story, Untangling the Roots of Hair in America. I actually stumbled upon that book about three months ago, because um, we were shocked that it was close to in the name, but of course, still had different issues. And it was just talking about how back, we're talking centuries ago, black hair in Africa was considered an extremely beautiful thing. In that book, it talks about how um, explorers would go to Africa and they would come back to their country and they would talk about the beauty of black hair and how they kept it and, and how they designed it. And the book continued on is to say when it came to the point of bringing slaves into North America, the first thing that was done was to shave off the hair of black people. And they were saying that at that point that shaving off the hair was shaving off their pride and their identity. So black hair, even from then, it's it's a part of, it's an identity piece. It's unfortunate though, we're in a society where it's something that people struggle with, whether it's a beautiful thing or it's not a beautiful thing. Myself and Anne-Marie Scott, we were just in casual conversation at work about black hair care. That somehow just evolved in the fact that we found out that there were many calls coming into our office from black youth in care who were telling us that they did not have the allowance or the amount of money they needed to use black hair products in care. They were forced into using products such as and head and shoulders, where they would leave from home and have hair, but they said by the end of the year, their hair was gone or the texture had changed. So Emery and I were saying that this is a, an initiative that the office needs to take on because we do have all colors in the care system and we need to, at this point, focus on black youth. This is something that's been in the work since 2012. I thought this, um, a project like this was important because I don't often see black youth having a space to talk, a space for people who make decisions that may affect them to hear them. So I thought, why not create a project that would basically get them to tell their stories? So one of the biggest platforms that Hair Story provides in terms of elevating the voices of black youth in Ontario is our Youth Advisory Committee. So our Youth Advisory Committee is comprised of right now I think my number's a little wrong, but about 16 young people from various regions in Ontario. And we really put their voices on, on the, the, the highest level of platform. They guide us and inform every single step we do. And by having the Youth Advisory Committee provide us that feedback, tell us their experiences, we're able to really drive the project where the project should go. We, we don't, as adults, create the change. The youth are here to create the change. We've done a lot of rice education-based uh, workshops and reaching out to youth in other in communities all around Ontario. The hair story model is about starting with where you're at. Who are you? The most basic question you can possibly ask. As a lot of people may know, the stuff that's going on in the media, the stereotypes that are being attributed to black men and the associations with, with baggy sweaters and hoods and, and, and toques and what that means, drug dealers, gangbangers, and so forth. We wanted a powerful, almost a, like a kind of Black panther -y sort of way. We wanted a powerful group of young people that all, that all represent that very, that very stereotype that the media seems to 
think black youth are the baggy sweaters, the, the toques. But what they don't realize is under those baggy sweaters and under the toques, we got child and youth workers, we have politicians, we have lawyers, we have doctors. So we really just wanted to deconstruct that stereotype and really just reclaim it. The goal of Hair Story is that we would gather black youth together where they can discuss their experiences of black youth as black youth in care and come up with recommendations for government officials and stakeholders to help better the experience for black youth in care. It began with hair and now we are at a point where we are beyond hair. This forum, the theme is overrepresentation. This conference is a way for all youth across Ontario to get their message across. There are nine art uh, platforms. There is dance, spoken word, uh, singing, dramatic arts, rapping, poetry. We learned a lot of stuff about black history and about other diversities like the Caribbeans. I think it's a really good opportunity being here because everyone has their own opinion and even though like it may not be all the same, I feel like it's really good for contrast and expanding and strengthening your own opinion. I met many youth that had the same experiences as me, so it was or had different ones. And even though we had different experiences, we're all here for the same reason. So we were able to form friendships, to talk about various issues. Everyone's really clicking with each other. It feels like, a, like everyone's a family, you know what I mean? Like we've known each other for a long time. There was um, a wonderful dance that was put on by one of our First Nations facilitators. And it was amazing to see our black youth make a circle around her. And they were in awe of her talent and her gift of dance. I wish it all to stop, oh, 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 to follow who you are, follow your dreams. I wish it all to dream, oh, oh, to follow who you are, follow your dreams. Oh, hey, 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 oh, I identify as black from West Africa. I'm also Latin, which is Cuban Taino and Plains Creek. I am Jamaican from St. Ange Parish and also Anishinaabe from White Sand First Nation. There are so many similarities between the black community and the and the and the Cree community or the native community because of the the racism that happens just on a daily basis. But we also talked about how we're also separate. We're separated from each other. Like a lot of the times it's either the black community does something and then the native community does something. And then for us that are in the middle, we're like, we want to have it combined. We want to have people coming together. So being able to be here and to tell our story and to share and listen to their stories, it's refreshing. It's almost like being home or being with your family. We had an open mic where the talent around the room was just breathtaking to see the amount of youth that had, whether it's singing, whether it's writing. For this weekend, I've seen a lot of youth transition into just being themselves. They're open, um, nobody's watching them, they're in their comfort zone. This weekend brought out their true colors and their true identity of who they really are. The best experience is like I got to connect with people like my own culture because I'm from a Caucasian society. So like being with kids who are like my color felt really cool. So they understood like where I'm coming from and like what needs I have and need to be met. Hair story, I love it. Like this, this four day adventure experience has been amazing. It's almost been an awakening for me in a sense. I can honestly say this whole experience was, was mind blowing for me, I should say, because I've never actually been around a whole group of, of, of black people where there wasn't violence involved for some sort of reason or between the male and females. And so just being here and being accepted by, by Everyone, no matter what hood or whatever you come from, that nobody came up to you and really tried to, tried to start problems with you. Instead, they wanted to just be like your brother or like your sister. So just that aspect of the whole event, kind of with us being all together as one, peacefully, was a good change for me. The most impressive part of the conference for me was the round table, where the young people had an opportunity to talk to the service providers, government, and the advocates about their lived experience in terms of what they experience in our community, the struggles that they face, their day to day, the fact that they don't own positions of leadership and have the opportunity to have a say. It was rewarding. It, 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 
it felt very empowering to see our young people take that stance and ask the government to create opportunities where they can, you know, stand in roles of leadership, where they can, you know, develop a sense of individuality. It was, it was even more rewarding to see our young people work together in small groups because I think the community has a belief that our young people cannot work together. So it was nice to see them work together and come up with a message that they could stand behind, a message that they all kind of bought into in terms of what changes, changes needed to be made in our community and push that message not just for themselves but for other young people who are coming after them. As a black male, I took away uh, a deep passion connection that touched me personally in my own life, uh, helping me to reflect on how I got to where I am and how can I help young people to get to where they want to be. The youth have spoken. They don't want it to be just about words. They want it to be about action. You know how it feels. 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 You don't know my name and know my story. Arts is one of the ways that we allow black youth to elevate their voices, scream to the highest mountain, and ensure that their voices and their experiences are heard and most, most importantly, validated. Seeing them come out of their shell, express it through different arts forms like dance, music, singing, etc., creative writing. Like you, you see the goodness of what these youth are capable of doing and not what a CES worker or a foster parent or a school board or whatever would say about them in their records. If anyone does not know, Miracle is an amazing, amazing writer. And I've read some of her pieces and it has touched me and she is amazing. The piece is called To My Forefather. I feel you're angry like a brick wall. I feel your frustration like a burning fire waiting for an ice to cool it down. Different era, different obstacles, and different perceptive. To imagine that you have walked and seen many rivers, that is beyond me. And to think that you have been through worse than I am, and that what I am going through, I haven't gone through half of what you have gone through. I haven't experienced the things that you have. I felt your agony and betrayal. You might, say, you might say that I am just young, ignorant, and spoiled. You might be shocked. I have walked 400 miles of the life journey and have come to the conclusion for man to survive in this world he has anticipated for the unknown to reveal itself. Many bridges to cross, you might think, and the uncertainty is yet to present itself. But I wait for them all. Miracle. Yes, yes, yes. Give it up for Miracle one more time. I enjoy writing. And when I'm writing, I focus on, like, my soul part. As an injured girl. And as an injured girl, people have a lot to give to the world. I bonded with people through dance. Like this young girl named Mercy, like we got to bond through dance, which is really cool. I feel like music is a great way to reach people, even on a subconscious level, and, and just spread positivity and love, because sometimes it just over overcomes you. And I feel like art is a very powerful way to just spread positive messages and get your point across and just heal. Art is just so much, like, it's a great way to start any conversation. For 400 years, black people were enslaved. Now we're in a century where everyone is slave. Don't see the change, because the change is the break. The media will be pushing lies straight into the face.
When people face systemic barriers and discrimination in their dealings with the Child Welfare Agency, they face more scrutiny as young adults from police, schools, and even just being at the mall, are investigated, stopped, and questioned more often than others, and are given harsher sentences than other people. The overrepresentation of black people in this context, unfortunately, is not surprising. So this weekend, we'll be listening and hopefully we'll get some ideas from you on the way forward. We need people to be bringing their lived experiences to the forefront because this can't all be about laws and policies. It needs to be about people's lives. If I had work with workers who were like, who were culturally sensitive to me, that would have helped me a lot. If I had the opportunity to say something from my mind to them, I would say that they should put us black kids in homes where the foster parents are trained to take care of black kids and know our needs. When they make decisions for various youth, whether they be black or whatever background they have, we're never there when they make decisions. They never hear our voices. They may hear it through our workers who they make us speak with, but they never actually hear it from us. So to hear it from us, it's important because it's from our voices, it's our experiences, and it's our thoughts. When I work with young people in the roughest of neighborhoods, my thing is, if I can get you guys to see yourself differently, then the possibilities for what you can do change. If you only see yourself through a very negative lens and think that there's nothing positive about you, then it becomes extremely difficult for your actions to become positive, for your mindset to become positive. People just see like I'm positive and I, they're positive too, so it's good to be around positive people because it makes me feel better about myself. We have, we share the same struggles, but through those struggles, we still find strength from each other, from relating to each other, from sharing stories and just listening and collaborating. How I've seen some of the youth change, you could say some of the ones I thought were quieter, You like they say, never judge a book by its cover. They were able to use their various arts forms, say poetry, to find a voice and get their messages across, share their experiences and what they have on their mind because they realize they do have a voice. And I realized that's one of the main focuses that a lot of the youth I talk to, they, they say, I do have a voice. I do have a message to get across. These youth are finding their sense of identity, finding out who they are, learning their culture, learning about the different cultures that are within our community rather than stuck in their own little pockets. I don't want to go back to the streets anymore. I don't want to be going back to jail or none of that stuff because there's nothing in that life other than death, you know? So I just coming here just changed my thoughts about everything, everything. Just even me going to school wasn't even a thought. But now, like, I feel like I can really go out there and just because I'm labeled as a foster kid, that I wouldn't be labeled as those foster kids that will not succeed. I just really hope the policies that we bring to the stakeholders and the people that can actually help bring change in six years are something we can look back and make annual reports and say, look, this is six years ago we did this and this, and as a result, this and this happened, and now we have a better a better community for the youth that we serve. I also see Hair Story changing organizations as well, changing how they view black youth, view them as individuals, view them as unique individuals, rather than placing them and thinking that they're all the same. Now that I know I have a voice and that I will be heard, I'm gonna continue to talk to youth and talk to like people that are close to me so they can spread the word because it starts off with one person. I would like people who are listening to this realize that there is always hope and that there is always strength, that there is always dignity, no matter where you come from or the color of your skin, that unity is powerful and that when you have one voice speak, it's one voice, but when you have multiple, it's a choir and it is a song that will not be silenced.
since the forum, what we've been doing is uh, gathering all the information that we were able to gather from the forum, uh, from young people, uh, their experiences, their recommendations, and we've been putting that all into a binder to collect all that information and then write a report from it. The reason for doing this is because we want to make sure that what the young people have said is able to be documented and put out there. So hopefully the community, government and organizations can take and hear and see what young people have said and hopefully address some of those concerns. Young people that came to our event in 2016, they said it changed their lives and just that one experience helped them get off the streets and make a shift in their lives to do better and to create changes for the next generation coming up behind them. And just talking to a lot of young people, they said the most important part of Hair Story was it's not putting the recommendations forward, it's the sense of family and universalization that they're not in it alone. They have a peer group that's going through similar experiences and when you bring them together, they can overcome those experiences and make a positive change. It's something that just can't be stopped and despite whatever politics is going on right now, it's a project that's important. It's a project that's needed. It's the voices of young black people who experience racism and it's the voices of young black people who matter and the voices of young black people who have great things to offer. Bum 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 Moving forward, Hair Story is going to become a not-for-profit. It's going to stand in community where it belongs, and it's going to be a place where young people could still come together and continue that legacy that was from Anne-Marie and Erica um, and the reasons why they started Hair Story to begin with, and to see it really hold its place in community because that's where it belongs. In addition to having young people a part of the nonprofit, we feel like it's also important to have the community on board as well because we want the community to rally around the young people so their voices are being heard. And also to give the young people that confidence they need so that they can move forward and feel like th their voices are being heard and they are making a difference. <laughs>